Hello, and welcome to another edition of Cultural Conversations with the Big South. I'm your host, Darius Thigpen. For Black History Month, we have a special guest joining us from Hampton University. We have Professor Robert C. Watson. So first off, Robert, your school, Hampton, are amongst the newest members to the Big South. As an HBCU, it's a different feel for the conference having Hampton in, and likewise for Hampton, having to leave some of the big rivalries to get across some of those other HBCUs and the MEAC. So from your, your standpoint, how has that transition gone into the Big South? I think, uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, commend Dr. Harvey for being a, a visionary. He and Mr. Marsha, who's the athletic director for uh, moving Hampton into uh, the Big South Conference. And I must admit, uh, like a lot of people, I had mixed emotions because I would gotten used to uh, Hampton uh, rivalries with Norfolk State and Morgan State and South Carolina State and Florida a and and so forth. And so it's going to take a while for us uh, as a university uh, to develop those same kinds of, of uh, rivalries with the Big South Conference members. But it will happen over time. As we kind of look at uh, the overall coming in for you, you are a wealth of knowledge in Black history, Caribbean history, Reconstruction, and West African history. So let's start with a bit on you. So where did your thirst for knowledge for Black history come from? You studied both chemistry and history for your undergrad, and it would seem that you're doing a little bit more with your history uh, than you did for your chemistry degree. <laughs> right. I, well, actually, I'm doing a lot more with my history than I did with my chemistry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the reason being is that when I was in high school, I was told that if you go into a science, a, a math, you know, chemistry, biology, that you will make a lot of money. But no one told me about whether I would have the passion uh, for those uh, particular disciplines. And I realized not only were those hard disciplines, but I didn't really have the pa passion for it. And so in my freshman year at Tougaloo College in Mississippi, I had the, the good fortune of having a professor uh, who was really uh, uh, tuned into, his, uh, into studying history. And this was a Jewish professor from um, New Jersey. Uh, like many of the HBCUs in the early, well, for most of, the, of, of, of their uh, uh, time, I've had a number of, of non-Black faculty. And so I had uh, Joseph Herzenberg uh, from New Jersey who encouraged me to study history because I seemed to show so much passion for history. On the other hand, my teacher, Albert Sleeter, was also, uh, uh, ironically, he was from Ferguson, uh, uh, Missouri. And I didn't find that out until uh, uh, what my 50th college class reunion that he was from Ferguson, but he was one of those people who said, "Well, you should make a you you will make a lot of money uh, being a chemist." But uh, he said, uh, "Robert, you really need to think about what it is you want to do and what you are passionate about." And so I went on and completed the requirement for the degree in chemistry, but I only used it for a little while, uh, as I mentioned, I believe previously, and that was to work in a, uh, a company that made soap powder. But all the time I knew that I was really a, a historian uh, in a chemist uh, uh, body. Uh, uh, I, I knew that. And so, uh, and this information I pass on to my students, uh, Darius, and that is that you have to do things that you are passionate about. Otherwise it becomes a job. Teaching history is, is not a job. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's something I'm very passionate about uh, and have been fortunate enough to um, be uh, in that career uh, in a very successful way. Well, as we look at what you've done now, and one of the things that really stood out to me from your bios I read through on the website was that you are a firm believer in that students should be social activists. Mm -hmm. So what have you thought about some of the activism that student athletes and professional athletes as well have mm -hmm. shown through groups like Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and a number of student-led initiatives across not just the Big South universities, but mm -hmm. all across the nation? Well, I think students need to be, well, student athletes need to be students first. 
and then uh, they need to be activists. They, they, they cannot divorce their lifestyle or just their living, uh, uh, just a, as a campus experience. Athletes live in the real world and the real world has problems. And those problems, uh, racism, uh, uh, in, in, in this society is, is, is there and it's systematic and student athletes should not be divorced from having an opinion, an informed opinion about these issues because they are in fact impacting student athletes uh, no matter where they are. And so I believe that uh, student organizations uh, on campuses, uh, fraternities and sororities uh, and other chapters, uh, other organizations should be very much involved uh, in, uh, in trying to make a, a significant difference in how we relate uh, across the color line. Uh, having said that, there, are, there, there, there is a history where you have the intersectionality of politics and sports. And we can go a long ways back uh, and we can go uh, back beyond, um, say, Muhammad Ali. Uh, we can go uh, back to uh, uh, Jesse Owens uh, and Joe Lewis and even Jack Johnson, uh, um, Wilma Rudolph, you know, Athea Gibson. These were people who clearly understood that as great as they were as athletes, uh, they were still not in many instances accepted as um, American citizens who should have had the same rights as others. Uh, and that brings us all the way up to the modern day athletes. They should, my thinking is that they need to have an opinion. Uh, recently, I, I uh, watched uh, uh, Naomi Osaka, uh, who I'm uh, uh, really admiring more and more because of her uh, stance. Uh, regarding social issues. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested uh, and very supportive of what LeBron James has done, uh, is doing. Uh, they have a history. You know, Jim Brown, uh, uh, Jackie Joyner Kersey, uh, uh, and of course, Jackie Robinson, you know. So there's a whole litany of names that I could call, but all of these people understood that they were Black in this case, and they had to stand uh, for issues because once they stopped playing basketball or football or whatever, uh, then they were like you and I in many ways. We were, we are American citizens and they were American citizens. Jackie Robinson found that out um, after he left uh, baseball uh, and, and became vice president uh, for a chock of nuts uh, in New York City. Uh, no longer having the protection, if you will, of being an athlete, he realized that this country, uh, that Blacks in this country were suffering uh, from lack of participation in the political system. Uh, and so today, when I look at an organization like Black, Black Lives Matter, uh, they are keeping, they're stoking the fire uh, by keeping this issue of how Black males in particular are treated in the society. And I don't care how many points you score on a basketball court or how many touchdowns you run or how fast you run the 100 uh, meters. Uh, in this society, uh, because of systematic racism, you're still a black person first, and then you are an athlete. And it's been so interesting to see how so many of those athletes, like you mentioned, will use their platform. A lot of people immediately Think to the WNBA, the U.S. women's soccer team, the NBA, tennis stars, like you mentioned, Naomi Osaka, Serena Williams as well. But I think a lot of what is happening with athletes needs to be contextualized by the NFL, where we've seen Colin Kaepernick, who's been out of football. He's now known more as a activist than he is a quarterback. Mm -hmm. You've seen with the Super Bowl this past year, you had a number of black assistant coaches mm -hmm. uh, like Eric Bieniemy for the Kansas City Chiefs, mm -hmm. Byron Leftwich for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Todd mm -hmm. Bowles for the Buccaneers as well, mm -hmm. where these are guys, these are men who would normally be getting the hype about up and rising new head coach. Mm -hmm. Normally that's the way the Super Bowl kind of goes. Those assistant coaches get poached off to other teams. You're not really seeing that right now. So I do want to ask you, 
about the Rooney rule specifically, mm -hmm. where we see all of these uh, available head coaching positions year on year, but still two black head coaches in the NFL at the moment. So mm -hmm. what do you think about the Rooney rule compared to what it should be and where it is right now? I think when, when the Rooney, uh, Rooney rule was uh, first instituted, it, it, it had a, a great impact because I really believe that Art Rooney was genuine uh, in his efforts to uh, uh, promote uh, assistant coaches to head coaching positions in the NFL. But I think um, it starts with the owner, uh, the owners. Uh, and so he in fact did what he wanted to do, have uh, black candidates interviewed and not just as a show, but as a real commitment to promoting black coaches, which is why Mike Tumlin uh, is where he is today. But on the other hand, the other 31 owners throughout the league, except for now uh, the one other owner who just hired uh, a black person, uh, they really are ignoring the Rooney rule. Uh, they are not, they're not really bringing in with any real genuine commitment to promoting someone like a Biani, uh, um, Eric Biani, um, Ty Bowles, who, won, who really was at one time a head coach. Um, um, Byron Let Lethwich. Uh, these people deserve uh, an opportunity. But unless the owners uh, step up and say, you know, uh, this guy can do the job, then uh, the Rooney Rule uh, will continue to be ineffective. Uh, I would argue uh, that, the, that it needs to be revisited and, uh, and if it's not going to be seriously considered, then uh, stop being hypocritical about it. You know, uh, uh, create something that has some genuine effect uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of hiring people who are as qualified, in some instances more qualified than some of the people who've been hired. Yeah, I know that uh, the topic comes up every single year, it feels like. And then the question becomes, well, if, if it's not the Rooney Rule, then what legislation can you have in place? The Rooney Rule, as it's constructed currently, for anyone who doesn't know, it's all about you have to have an interview with a black head coach and candidate. And after that, the Rooney Rule is satisfied. So that doesn't guarantee anyone will then be able to move up the ladder that way. So from your standpoint, is there anything that can be legislated in or does it really just come down to the owners, like you said? Well, at this point, I think um, there, there, it, there, sh there should be, obviously the Rooney Rule is not working. So what uh, basically I understand, if I understand what you're asking, what, what should be an alternative uh, to the Rooney Rule? Well, I think uh, one of the ways uh, to uh, uh, create an alternative is that if you know as a candidate that you are going to be interviewed. Don't do the interview. I frankly believe that uh, because you know that the, the interview is a sham. And some people will say, well, you, you're cutting off your, your, your nose to spite your face. No, you're not. If it's not working, then I think we have to go 180 degrees in the opposite direction. If that sounds like a, a boycott of the Rooney Rule, then that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, the, the, the NFL is 77% black. Where, where are the players? And where, where is uh, Smith and the players union doing? What, what are they doing? You know, these questions have to be seriously asked by the stars in the league and not just the, uh, the, the, the black stars. You know, Tom Brady uh, should be asking these kinds of questions. He should not get a pass on the race question. You know, seriously, he, I, I, I have the utmost respect uh, for someone uh, Brady's age who's winning Super Bowls over younger guys like Mahomes. But that does not mean uh, that he should be excused. He should not get a, a, a pass uh, on, on that. He should be speaking up, as well as some of the other stars, Drew Brees, who did a lot of um, uh, uh, moonwalking after the comments that he was asked, uh, that he made after the, the George Floyd uh, uh, killing. Those are the people who can make a difference. Uh, and so uh, it, it's not just a black issue, it's a, an American issue. 
And in this case, in the NFL, it definitely is a black and white issue. Um, you know, uh, the, the most recent controversy, and I follow this pretty closely, uh, when Urban Myers uh, hired someone who the players uh, apparently would have had some problems uh, uh, playing, uh, being trained by. Uh, how can you not know this man's background? Uh, if, even if you vetted him to the degree that you claim you vetted him, then you would have made a different choice. And I'm not saying that the choice that would have been made would have been an African American, but at least it would have been a different choice and a player and a person who credentials would not have been questioned the way they are now. And so at least that man in this case would egg on his face. Uh, owners in the NFL and all the other major sports, if they're, very, if they're serious about hiring uh, black people in these positions, then do it. You know, that's the way, that, that's the alternative. You know, stop talking and do it. And I love that you highlighted that it's not just on the black players or the black coaches or the black administrators to solve what's going on with what's happening to black people, but it's on everyone. Just I feel like that kind of encapsulates uh, the, the whole conversation around all of this, that it's not just a black people thing. Mm -hmm. You guys figure it out, but it's it's on everyone right. to be a part That's of right. it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 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 racism in America is not a black problem. It's a white problem. If, if it was a black problem, we would have solved it a long time ago. But because it's considered a black problem, it's not considered really as important as it ought to be. Uh, so because it's uh, considered a black problem, there is no real effort consistently to solve the problem of race, particularly the problem of systematic racism uh, in our country. And this is our country, all of ours. Well, kind of sticking with football, uh, I know you've spoken with the Hampton football team a number of times. Uh, it was actually Coach Prudy who uh, recommended that we speak with you. Uh, so what kind of talks have you given to the football team? Okay. Well, first of all, let me thank uh, Coach Prunty. He, he's a guy who has a lot of credibility uh, uh, in the community already. Uh, he's one who is sincere about what he's doing. And he's definitely uh, happy about, uh, uh, committed to uh, uh, our athletes being student athletes. Uh, let me say that about him first. And that's why I appreciate the opportunity uh, that he offered you guys to talk with me. So, so there you have it there. In terms of my conversations with uh, the football team, as well as all the athletes, is that they're students first, that they, of students and then they are athletes. And, and say it and, and, and letting them know that, I tell them they need to know their history. They need to know American history. They need to know African American history because African American history is in fact American history. And so they need to know that. But I also tell them that they are privileged to be at a university to do something that they love doing. And they represent not only the university, but they represent themselves, they represent their families, and they should act accordingly. So that means knowing your history, uh, studying when you know it's time to study, uh, get your work in the way other students do. It's tough being an athlete. I understand that. And that was one of the things I uh, uh, would always and still do. You know, uh, don't cut the athletes in the slack because they're athletes. But at the same time, understand that their circumstances are different. I know when athletes go on the road, they, it's a whole different venue uh, where you play a game, you go back to the hotel, and you're tired. It's hard to study. But fortunately, uh, uh, Mr. Marsha and his predecessor, Mr. Nobel Dickerson, uh, and, and, and currently uh, Ms. Winston and, and Andrew Dickerson and uh, the current uh, academic support person, uh, uh, Dr. Lavallee, these people have worked 
and are working very hard to, uh, to make our students understand. And I always carry that message to the student. They, they'll tell you, I carry it to them when I speak to them as a group, but also in, in the uh, classroom because I have a number of them who uh, take my courses. So um, they probably get tired of hearing it, but um, I'm, it's, it's my class and they're going to, to hear. Yes, sir. And uh, you speak from experience as well. Uh, I, we, I think we can all tell that you're a bit of a sports fan, but you're also an athlete as well. High jumper in track and baseball, big fan of Jackie Robinson. Uh, how does your sports uh, history kind of factor into just your studies? Well, it, it factors in uh, uh, because I know you can do both. And I, I admit that the times are, are different uh, than when I was a high jumper uh, over 50 years ago. But I had a son who was uh, all state uh, uh, in track uh, and, and football and, uh, and, and a daughter who was an athlete and another daughter who was a golfer uh, and another uh, son who played quarterback in high school up in New Jersey. So I told them the same thing I would tell my students and tell my students that being an athlete makes you special. But one of the things that it should do, which it did for me, was uh, give me discipline. Uh, the discipline to train, to uh, repeat the same uh, regimen is the same thing you can do and when you're reading a book. Uh, you have to discipline yourself to do what it is that uh, will allow you to accomplish your goal. And so as an athlete, that's what I did. Uh, I can remember uh, Darius, um, uh, you know, going out and, and, and running and training and then having to go back and learn uh, organic chemistry, uh, which was challenging. Uh, and so we have athletes who can do that, you know, um, athletes who become role scholars. Uh, again, uh, just thinking about my, my, my son, he's... Uh, he was a, a, a Fulbright scholar at Morgan State uh, and played football for two years and did track in the MEAC for four years, you know. So, um, and my daughter, uh, who uh, is finishing a PhD from Purdue, but played basketball and, and uh, ran track in high school. And the youngest one who just uh, completed a master's degree at San Jose State. I'm saying this because my children are not the exception to the rule. They, in fact, should be, as other uh, kids are capable of doing what I just said I could do, what they are doing. And we have athletes like that at Hampton. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that a number of them on the volleyball team, the track team, um, uh, uh, under uh, Coach Pierce, uh, have done a tremendous job. As uh, as student athletes, they are, they uh, make the, the 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 honors roll, so to speak, um, and that's 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 refreshing, and so I encourage them, you know. So the fact that I did it was not not so much an exception, as much it was and what I expect uh, of being the rule. Absolutely. The brain is a muscle group, so you might as well work all your muscles, not just your physical. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> correct. So That's you mentioned correct. already the, um, how much Black history ties into American history, I mean, that it's not two different subjects, that it's all intertwined. Yes. One of the uh, things I wanted to mention, uh, you and Dr. Vanessa Thornton Ward were uh, appointed to a commission on African-American history education by Virginia Governor Ralph Northam back in 2019. Yes. And it sounds like it was something kind of like a uh, localized version of the 1619 project for the New York Times, if anyone's uh, familiar with that project. Mm -hmm. So what has this commission produced? What, what things did you all find? Okay. What we found, well, first of all, it was, a, it was an honor uh, for Vanessa, Dr. Uh, Vanessa Thaxon Ward and, I, and, and myself to represent Hampton University uh, on this commission of 33 people who were chosen from throughout the state of Virginia. Um, by uh, uh, Governor Northam. And what we found is that there is a, uh, that Virginia has done a very poor job. They, that is, uh, uh, people who design the curricula 
uh, for the state of Virginia had done a very poor job in providing our students with a holistic interpretation of Virginia's history. Uh, and so our task was to make the uh, curricula uh, more inclusive, uh, more diverse, uh, and be culturally responsible in what uh, we want uh, young people in Virginia to learn. And it's a, it's, it's, it, so we produced a document um, uh, that we uh, uh, believe will in fact become the template for how to have a more holistic interpretation of Virginia's history. Uh, and you can imagine that when you uh, dealing with the culture as we are, uh, that you're going to have some people who are very supportive of, 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 of more inclusive approaches to teaching history. And then you're going to have some people who uh, think it should remain th that it's just okay where it is. So why mess with it? Why tamper with it? Why try to change it? And so at this stage, uh, the document that we produced is in fact uh, in the Department of Education uh, for the state of Virginia. And uh, I'm not sure when it's going to roll out uh, uh, at this stage. I'm not uh, privy to that part of the information. I was primarily involved in um, uh, the content. Um, development uh, in the uh, for the project. My hope is uh, that this does not just drag on and on and on. Uh, that at some point we see the actual um, implementation of our uh, work to try to make uh, uh, the curricula more diverse in terms of what young people learn. And and perhaps you know uh, I'm I'm also optimistic. Uh, that we don't, that we will not have to always celebrate African American History Month, that it becomes um, uh, like McDonald's, 365 and the fourth day celebrated. I think that's a, a, a really worthy goal. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the findings. Uh, there is a PDF online, as you mentioned, uh, on the governor's website. Uh, we, we should be able to make that link available for anyone who wants to find it. Uh, one of the things that's happened with the COVID-19 pandemic is that there were these panels and town halls across Virginia that were scheduled for 2020, where a lot of these findings and recommendations that you all came up with were supposed to be disseminated and released to the public, mm -hmm. obviously weren't able to do those in-person um, in gatherings. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is something for someone who's going to go in and they just want to kind of do the cliff notes, they just want to find a few things to start with and then delve into it further? Mm -hmm. What do you think should be the things they focus on when they go into those mm -hmm. findings? I, I think what, what people should focus on when they look at the document is the objectives, the learning objectives for, for each grade. I think they look, need to look at the, the age in which uh, uh, Virginians are introduced to, uh, the, to the history of Virginia. What I mean by that is that uh, don't just focus on 1619, but uh, uh, delve beyond 1619 and also uh, look at uh, information and documentation that deals with at least African-American presence in uh, Virginia before 1619. Um, because there, there is quite a bit of that information as well. I think they need to look to see whether all segments of the population are represented in the curricula. Uh, when I say segments, I'm talking about the segments that deal with uh, class, gender, and race. Um, the, it, it's, it's, it's easy to talk about the conflict, uh, but it's also important to talk about the confluence of uh, three cultures coming together uh, in, uh, in Virginia uh, and compare that with uh, uh, how cultures came together in other parts of the country, not only just the English colonies, but also in, 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 in your uh, place like Florida, you know, um, the Seminoles uh, and, and what that means. And so I would uh, also suggest that people look for uh, certain personalities, uh, what we're going to call iconic figures, uh, but also look at those figures that may not be so iconic. You know, most people, 
uh, are familiar with, say, in Virginia, a Nat Turner and his rebellion. But how many people are, uh, know uh, uh, about the achievements of someone like uh, an Elizabeth Keckley? Uh, uh, if you uh, know uh, about, say, uh, uh, James Armstead at Lafayette, uh, how many people in Virginia would know uh, about uh, someone like uh, Dred Scott, who was born in Virginia? So those are the kinds of things I will, I will look at the content, uh, which makes sure that the right questions are being raised. Uh, you know, I would raise questions about issues like resistance, uh, because the emphasis generally is on things like culture. But black folk were not being happy, were not happy being slaves anywhere, and certainly not in Virginia. So I would look as an observer, as one who was diving into this document. I would look for those places where black people were resisting uh, their status. I would look at the Norfolk 17, uh, who were instrumental in the integration of the Norfolk public schools. Uh, so those kinds of things I would look at. I'd look at people like um, Barbara Johns, uh, who uh, uh, was sent uh, by her family from uh, Farmville, Virginia, uh, to, to Alabama. For safety, imagine that, you know, being sent from from Farmville, Virginia, because her uncle, who was the pastor at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, the one that Dr. King would would, would eventually pastor, but going from Virginia to, um, you know, that's amazing. Going from 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 Virginia to Alabama, where you hope the relation would be uh, better. Those are the kind of things that I would look at. You know, look at someone like uh, a, a, a um, um, uh, Arthur Ashe, who go from Richmond to St. Louis. Uh, yeah, he, uh, Ashe went to uh, Sumner High School in, uh, in St. Louis, where he did some of his training under a man named Richard Hullen, who also helped to train Jimmy Connors um, uh, for tennis. You know, so look at those kinds of things. That's a, that's a, a, another whole story. And that's and that's so great to have all of that at your fingertips to just go and be able to really delve into it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know for a lot of people who are looking at this past year, uh, because a lot of times I think a lot of black people have heard the question, oh, well, where can I start? Where can I research? Mm -hmm. What can I do to help? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There are a number of people who don't know much about black history outside of slavery, Martin Luther King, civil rights era, mm -hmm. and then today. Mm -hmm. So how do you begin to describe black history in mass in total to mm -hmm. someone who truly is a beginner at, at mm -hmm. the, uh, at that education level? Mm -hmm. I would start, I, I, I think one of the best sources that I would recommend um, to start with is a, is a, a book written by uh, the late uh, but renowned journalist, uh, Lerone Bennett. Um, he wrote a book called Before the, the Mayflower. It's a great source to start with. It's easy reading. Uh, I would recommend that book almost over any book that, that, that I could, uh, would recommend in terms of getting a, a general knowledge of African-American history. You cannot go wrong reading um, um, the, autobiography, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, I would read it. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who would say, well, Malcolm X was this and Malcolm X was that. But Malcolm X really understood the issue of race in America. There are a lot of contemporary scholars. Uh, Eric Dyson uh, is, a, is a great read. Um, Darlene Clark Hine uh, uh, and her husband uh, and another man named Harold wrote a great book called An American Odyssey. Easy reading, a lot of primary sources. And then, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention um, uh, uh, one of my favorite authors, Dr. John Hope Franklin, uh, who wrote the, um, this, uh, the great work From Slavery to Freedom. Okay. I, I would read that. Um, 
And I'm going to recommend two other books and then I'll, uh, The Souls of Black Folks. Anyone who goes to college should not leave that college without having read The Souls of Black Folks by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, it's, a, it's a must read. Zora Neale Hurston, anything that she wrote or writes, I wrote rather, I would read it. Okay. I would recommend it. Okay. Now, of course, there has been pushback on mm -hmm. teaching black history to the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, a case that's come up uh, within this past month. In Utah, there is a school where headlines were made because they were allowing parents to opt out of their students from learning during black history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when there are these alternative history lessons that are put together or something that isn't direct and true to what actually happened in the history and you have these roadblocks to teaching people, how can you go, as an educator mm -hmm. go about teaching people the truth or, mm -hmm. or, or showing them what it is that they weren't taught growing up? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question because there will always be pushback against things that people don't want to know. Uh, are afraid to know. Um, programs like this, African American History uh, uh, Month, uh, is necessary right now, and you have to adopt the attitude never give up or never give in. Because once you allow uh, that kind of uh, pessimism, to determine your thinking, then we lose. The classic example was the example you just gave. Another classic example is that there are still people in this country who do not believe that the Civil War was about slavery. It was. And you have to continuously say it and you have to continuously teach it. You're going to get pushed back. But I like the Jewish model in this regard as, 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 a, as a part answer to the question. The Jews say never again. And we know what they mean. What they mean is that they will never allow Jews to go back into those, to be put in those concentration camps. The wandering Jew found a home in Israel in 1948, partly with the help of a black man named Ralph Bunch, who was part of that, that uh, decision-making at the United Nations, that the Jews found the home, and they say never again. There is something about the Holocaust every year on television, uh, in the movies, about the suffering that they went through. We have to have the same persistent attitude. When black people, and some do, say, well, we don't want to talk about slavery because it was a painful period. It was a painful period, but the fact that I can sit here and talk to you is evidence of the strength of a people who survived. And so I should be honored to want that history to be known. Not just by me as a black person, but I want everybody to know it. That somewhere in the holes of that ship that landed in the Americas, there was someone in my background, how many generations back, who survived the middle passage and made it possible for me to have a conversation. And so I wanna make certain as an educator that I do not allow anyone or anybody to get in my way to make sure that story is not continuously told. I think the Jewish model is a good one. That's powerful. That's powerful. I love that. Uh, one thing I do want to kind of leave on as we start to wrap up, uh, one of the reasons why we're having this conversation over Zoom is because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And when Black people have faced it this this over this past year, it has been exponentially more felt throughout black communities. The old saying goes, when white people get a cold, black people get pneumonia. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to what you think the historical significance of COVID-19 will be 
on black communities throughout America, across the world. We've seen this happen in other countries as well, like in Brazil with flavelas, where mm -hmm. disease has gone through and there. Uh, for, for black people across the world who have had their sufferings uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, what do you think the historical significance mm -hmm. of this last year will be? I think, um, I think the legacy of COVID-19, uh, this virus, coronavirus, I think the legacy it's going to take a while for historians to actually uh, analyze it uh, to the extent that they can write about it in, in an objective way. But at the same time, uh, the, there will be certain things that will always be a part of the legacy, and that is how much the people of color suffer as a result of not having access uh, to uh, the vaccines. Uh, and, and, and secondly, uh, uh, how the black people themselves resist uh, uh, taking the vaccine out of fear of past uh, uh, events involving black people in medicine. Uh, I think those are going to be two legacies. Uh, the, uh, but I think that the, the good thing uh, is that, well, what I hope, and this is what I hope, and, and strongly believe that black people will look at the past and learn that it was in our best interest in spite of, of, of uh, the resistance to taking the vaccine. I think black people are going to look back and say it was in our best interest to take the vaccine, otherwise we uh, won't, will not be here. And, and what, I, what, what I'm, um, what I'm also saying here is that we, we understand that there's a thing such as medical apartheid that has occurred throughout the history of, of, of Blacks in medicine. There's no doubt about that. The Tuskegee study that everybody points to, the Turpentine study, all these studies uh, that people point to, uh, uh, you know, the development of polio, uh, the polio vaccine where people resisted. But look where we are now. We are. We survived that, and we will survive this. Uh, so that's my take on that. All right. Well, let's uh, wrap up on a little bit of a lighter note. As as we normally conclude, we usually po point out a charity or a group that one of our guests is involved in. But I would like to get, let's just say, the starting point for someone who's completely overwhelmed by the entire conversation. They're going to have to go back three, four times before it really sinks in. Mm -hmm. What is the one starting point for them that you would just point out and say, go read this author or go listen to this or go watch this? Okay. I would say go watch this, your program. I would also say uh, watch uh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates' uh, uh, weekly program. I know now it's called Finding Our Roots. And the emphasis is, is on uh, the church, the black church. I would say watch PBS and watch that. I would start with that if you want to start with something where you, because we are visual people. We, we like to see things. Uh, and so I would do that. Uh, that, that. That would be my recommendation at this point. Okay. And as uh, I like to do to wrap up everything from our end, uh, I want to shout out the Black Play-by-Play -play Grant and Scholarship Fund. So the fund is a scholarship opportunity for Black college students interested in learning the art of sports play-by-play -play who want to get into broadcasting. Uh, we're creating a growing network of young Black broadcasters that they'll be able to rely on to reach out to mentors, and they'll be able to start their careers in the right direction so that they don't have to try to navigate the waters on their own. It's really a, a broadcasting can be an industry where you have to afford to not be paid for the first few years mm -hmm. taking internships. So mm -hmm. trying to alleviate some of that with the uh, Black Play by Play fund mm -hmm. and grant scholarship. So mm -hmm. trying to get that going for the broadcast booth as well as mm -hmm. in the education realm as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, you have been fantastic. I truly appreciate your time mm -hmm. coming on the program and just giving us all of your thoughts. You are a knowledge resource, a wealth of wisdom. I truly appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much. This has been a great opportunity for me. And again, I'd like to thank you, Darius, uh, Brandon, and uh, Jim, um, as well as uh, uh, 
anyone who's been involved uh, and who is involved in this program. Uh, so I like to leave it there and just say, go Pirates. All right. Thank All you, right. Professor. Thank you, viewers, for tuning in to Cultural Conversations with the Big South. We'll catch you next time. Very good.